Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Thanks for coming during lunch in San Francisco, and welcome to Authors at Google. My name is Rachel O'Mara, and I'm really excited today to host our author, John Robbins. So John Robbins is the author of nine bestsellers that have collectively sold more than three million copies and been translated into 26 languages. His books include The Food Revolution, The Classic Diet for a New America, and most recently, No Happy Cows, Dispatches from the Front Lines of the Food Revolution. Currently, he is also one of the most bloggers on the Huffington Post. As an advocate for a compassionate and healthy way of life, John is the recipient of the Rachel Car Carson Award, the Albert Schweitzer Humanitarian Award, the Peace Abbey's Courage of Conscious Award, Green America's Lifetime Achievement Award, and many other accolades. Well done, John, that's great. <laughs> the only son of the founder of the Baskin Robbins ice cream empire, John Robbins was groomed to follow in his father's footsteps, but chose to walk away from Baskin Robbins and the immense wealth it represented to pursue the deeper American dream, the dream of a society at peace with its conscience because it respects the lives in harmony with all life forms. John is the founder and board chair emeritus of Earth Save International and has served on the boards of many nonprofit organizations. His work has been the subject of feature articles in the San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times, Chicago Life, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Time, US News and World Report, Newsweek, and many of the nation's other major newspapers and magazines. His life and work have also been featured in an award-winning hour-long PBS special titled Diet for a New America, and that's the book we'll be t talking about today. John lives with his wife of 45 years, Dio, and their son, Ocean, and his wife, Michelle, and his wife, Michelle and their grandsons, River and Bodhi, outside Santa Cruz, California. Their home is powered entirely by solar electricity. John also has a website, www.johnrobbins.info, for more details. So please welcome with me, John Robbins. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, as was mentioned, in your, your, thank you for the introduction. I, uh, was born into the, uh, an ice cream company family, Baskin Robbins, 31 Flavors. My father and uncle founded the company, owned the company, ran the company. I'm an only son. I have sisters, but no brothers. And my father groomed me to succeed him. It was his plan for my life that I would one day run Baskin Robbins, which was becoming and became during my childhood the world's largest ice cream company. It's a billion dollar company. And um, that, it was assumed. That's what I would do. And I loved it. I mean, I grew up eating more ice cream. I, I don't eat ice cream anymore. And when people find that out, they sometimes look at me with a, as if they're feeling sorry for me, I think. And I say, please don't. Please, really. I ate enough ice cream in my childhood for 20 lifetimes. We had an ice cream cone-shaped swimming pool in our backyard. We had a freezers with all of the months, 31 flavors plus experimental flavors plus it was every kid's dream in a way, in a way. In that, there was unlimited ice cream. I did eat ice cream for breakfast. It, it's true. It, it, was, it, was, it was really gross, actually. <laughs> and, and, um, but there's a shadow side to all that. Um, ice cream is really not a health food. It, it's not kale. <laughs> and uh, you can put some fruit in some of the sherbets and so forth. It's still basically very high in sugar. And, and most of the flavors are very high in fat, and the fat is highly saturated fat. It's not healthy. And so, people who eat a lot of it have health problems. My uncle, Bert Baskin, my dad's partner and brother-in-law, died of a heart attack at the age of 54. He was a very big man. He ate a lot of ice cream. And when he died, I asked my father, do you think there could be any connection between my uncle's fatal heart attack and the amount of ice cream he would eat. And my father looked at me and very piercingly said, no, no, no. His ticker just got tired and stopped working. And the expression on his face and the tone of voice said something else. It said, don't you ever ask that question again. Do you understand what I'm saying? John Bradshaw, the, the psychologist, 
uh, used to talk about there being no talk rules in families, taboo subjects that, that you just don't talk about in a given family, elephants in the living room that take up a lot of space, but no one mentions it. Because there's some kind of family dynamic at play in which there's not an ability to talk about that topic. In my family, one of the big elephants in the living room was that there could be a connection between ice cream and heart disease, or ice cream and health, or even food and health, that there might be a connection there. Because if you start down that slippery soap, food and health, you pretty soon get to ice cream and heart disease. And my father did not want to even consider the possibility that there might be a link, and I could understand why he would not want to. By that time, by the time of my uncle's death, which was in 1968, um, my father had manufactured and sold more ice cream than any human being who had ever lived on planet Earth. He didn't want to think the family product was hurting anybody, much less that it could have contributed to his partner, his brother-in-law, my uncle's death. But I felt I should. I felt I needed to consider, might there be that link? And um, the more I looked into it, the more I felt there was. And not just between ice cream and heart disease, but ice cream and diabetes. Um, my father developed diabetes, serious diabetes, later on. Um, uh, everybody in the family had these various issues, problems with weight everywhere. Um, and I, I make, want to make it clear it's not just Baskin Robbins as a company. It's ice cream. <laughs> you know Ben and Jerry's? Ben Cohen. Marvelous man, peace activist, very, very engaged person. Um, big guy, ate a lot of ice cream, co-owned Ben & Jerry's, uh, co-founded it, had a quintuple bypass in his late 40s. These kinds of things tend to happen when you eat a lot of ice cream. And if you're in the ice cream business, if you're running Baskin Robbins in particular, <laughs> that's what I would know about, you don't, you want people to buy as much as possible. That's the business model. That's how it works. So you want them to consume as much ice cream as possible. And the reality is when people eat it in excess, um, they get these health problems. So I was faced with an existential quandary. On the one hand, a lot of financial security. On the other hand, my integrity. And I made a choice for integrity, and I told my dad that under the circumstances, I was not going to follow in his footsteps. I was not going to work any longer in the company. And what I specifically said to him was this. I said, Dad, we live in a different time now than when you grew up. We live under a nuclear shadow where at any moment the unspeakable could happen. We live in a time when the environment is deteriorating rapidly under the impact of human activities. We live in a time when the gap between the haves and the have-nots is increasing. And that does not, to my eyes, create social stability or security for anybody, even the wealthy and privileged. It's undermining the social fabric. Um, we live in a time when 60,000 people on Earth, many of them children, die of uh, hunger, die of starvation every day, while elsewhere there's abundant resources going to waste. And then I said to him, Dad, do you understand that for me, feeling these issues and concerns as intensely as I do, inventing a 30-second flavor would just not be an adequate response for my life. <laughs> and he understood to the extent that he could, um, but I needed to be, be true to myself. And so I made a choice for integrity, and I walked away. And I also walked away from the money. To be in alignment with my integrity and my choices, I needed to have no access to, and I told him that I didn't want a trust fund, I didn't want to depend in any way, not one dollar, on his fortune, his achievements. <coughs> and with Dale, my wife, we've been together 46 years now, we moved away and lived very simply, back to the land, built a log cabin, grew our own food, 95% of what we ate for 10 years we grew. Um, and it was a real pendulum swing. I, uh, in the family I'd grown up in, I, I uh, jokingly would say, perhaps flippantly would say, that roughing it meant that room service was late. Um, now we were really roughing it, because we were living very simply, um, 
on, on land and, and trying to grow our food and dependent on what we could grow. Um, eventually, I wrote Diet for a New America, and um, it became a bestseller. It, it sold mil over a million copies um, and became something of a phenomenon. I, I received 60,000 letters. These are actual letters. This is before email. Uh, and uh, from people who read the book and wanted to communicate with me, and almost all of them said, this has touched me deeply. How can I get involved? What can I do? And I want to give you a little bit of what I was, tell you a little bit about what the book says, that so many people felt that they wanted to respond to th that way. Um, we just recently came out with the 25th anniversary edition of Diet for a New America, and that's what, what we have here today, um, with a new pre uh, not preface, but a new um, epilogue by me, a, a lengthy epilogue, uh, describing what's happened in the interim years. And I will talk a little bit about that, too. Basically, something has happened in modern meat production and dairy, dairy production and egg production, the animal factory industries, that most people don't know about. And the industries do not want people to know about it. In fact, uh, this year, they are uh, initiating in many state legislatures what are called ag-gag bills. These are, uh, this is legislation that it makes it a felony to videotape or photograph what takes place in slaughterhouses or feedlots or factory farms. Because there's been a series of exposés where people went undercover representing, uh, working for uh, Humane Society of the United States or Mercy for Animals or Compassion Over Killing or some other animal protection group have gone undercover as, as workers in these places with hidden cameras and gotten footage of what takes place and it comes out and it, people who see it are abhorred. They, they just find it deplorable, the cruelty, the, the lack of sanitation, uh, there's, sometimes there's fines, sometimes there's jail sentences, uh, people get upset, uh, there was a recent one in, in, in a California uh, feedlot where they, the, 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 one of the largest suppliers of beef for the school lunch programs. So, and they were breaking all of the rules. We don't have very many rules, but they were breaking all of them that we have. And so the industry doesn't want this kind of footage getting out. They don't want you to know what's happening. They don't want you to know. This is a war against awareness, basically. So the ag gag bills make it illegal to do that. And they've passed in four or five states. They've been initiated in another 12 or 14. Um, there's a real effort. All of these bills are almost identical. They were written by ALEC, the American Legislative, Legislative Exchange Council, which is a corporate front group. Um, and they're basically trying to lock the veil down uh, so people can't know. Well, I'm trying to lift the veil. And I have been for 25 years wanting to lift the veil. So people can see. I think you have a right to know how your food is produced, where it comes from. I think you, actually any animal would want to know. This is a bi basic biological thing. You're, before you eat something, you'd want to know, is it safe? Is it what it says it is? What's the backstory here? How did it arrive here? You know, is, there, is, it, is it healthy for me? Uh, what's going to happen to me if I eat it? Um, we, we have a food industry that does things to food. The problem isn't the food. I'm not trying to make you afraid of food. I don't want you to be afraid of food. I want you to love food. But you can't love what they've done to the food because it's, 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 if they genetically engineer it, and much of our food is today, uh, if, they've at, if it's grown with poisons that residues are in the food, um, th these things harm us. And, and they harm the bio biosphere upon which we depend and uh, on which our economy depends, on which, on which our whole future depends. So when we expose, when I expose, when others like me expose what's being done in the meat industry, in the dairy industry, in the egg industry in particular, um, I do so because I want people to have freedom of choice, not because I'm trying to tell you what to eat. And this is a critical distinction. I am myself, I eat a very plant-strong diet. I'm virtually vegan. But I'm not asking that you be. I'm asking that you be an integrity, be authentic to who you are, to what your values are, to what is in your heart, to what helps you live the highest and best life possible for you. 
And, and that's your decision and your determination. But you can't make those choices honestly and authentically if you don't have accurate information. And the industry won't give it to you. In fact, the industry is working very hard to prevent you from having it. I'm working very hard to, to allow you to have it. So I'm at odds with them. Um, they don't like me very much. And um, that's OK. Um, what I want you to know is that modern meat production has become, it treats the animals very, very differently than the images most people have of farms. Lassie and Timmy running around on the farm. Uh, they will use photographs of beautiful things. I'll give you an example. The California Milk Producers Association has an ad campaign called Happy Cows. They, it's a national campaign. They spend hundreds of millions on it. And, and they, the, the tagline is, great cheese comes from happy cows. Happy cows come from California. And they're selling California cheese nationally. They're trying to, to compete with Wisconsin and become the, the, the largest dairy state. So the photographs show cows grazing on beautiful green grass, pastures. Those photographs were taken in Auckland, New Zealand. Because the California dairy industry is centered in the Central Valley, particularly the San Joaquin Valley. And it's, all, it's, a, it's a desert there. It's dry. It's, there's no grass. They don't, they, these are feedlot dairies. There's, there's 20,000, 15,000 cows in a pen area. Uh, it's nothing like the images shown on, in the ads. In fact, I have sued, along with PETA, uh, sued the California Milk Producers Association over this ad campaign because I think it's false advertising. And, and I think it's a, there's a point here. If you, we, we know that people will pay extra for organic food. There are, there's a subsection of the marketplace, I happen to be part of it, that values organic food and will pay a little bit extra for that for that value. If someone were to sell as organic, label as organic food that was not, that was grown with poisons, that would be false advertising. That would actually be um, a criminal act against the people, cheating the people, who, who value this and are willing to pay extra for it. And we don't allow, we don't allow that. We have organic certification, um, which is third party, and it's objective, and it's verifiable. But when it comes to claims about humane treatment of animals, happy cows come from California, they say. That's a claim. It's not true, but we don't have any way of, uh, of asserting uh, any kind of verification on that. So they can get away with it. And then the people like me, maybe like some of you, who care about how animals are treated, in, in, who are going to be eaten, or their flesh or their milk, uh, is going to be consumed by us and want those animals to have a decent life, uh, to be treated with some degree of basic respect for their needs, um, are being exploited. Because we'll pay, we see an ad like that, oh, happy cows come from California, that, that touches us, that speaks to our heart. So we'll go out, out of our way to get the cheese that actually comes from a feedlot, but we don't know that because they, they're lying. This is just one example. The examples are, are, are numerous, to, way, way numerous. And what's happened is we have put modern livestock in confinement uh, under conditions that frustrate their, their natures, that, that violate their natures to such an extent. You do not have to be a vegetarian or an animal rights activist or even a particularly empathic human being if you see it, how, how severe it's become, to find it abominable, appalling. If you have any feeling whatsoever for animals, and, and, and most of us do, most, most, of, most of us actually, most Americans actually, love animals to some degree. Now, I'm not saying you, 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 you love them more than people, but you love them for who they are. And, and as a country, we, we treat our dogs and our cats pretty well as a rule. Not always, but as a rule. Many of us consider them part of our families. We pay their vet bills. We buy their food, we, we, we have them sleep on our beds with us, we give them names, they're part of our families. We, we feel enriched by those relationships as human beings. We love them. They love us very often, quite, quite beautifully back. But sadly, 
we also have a very schizoid relationship to animals. In that, in this country, if, if it's an animal that we call a companion animal, we treat it very well. But if we call the animal dinner, if we find its flesh tasty, we put it in a different category. Now, there are laws in every one of the 50 states about cruelty to animals, restricting certain things you can't do. But in every one of the 50 states, the legislation that exists exempts animals destined for human consumption. So animals destined for human consumption have no protections under the law. And this is how the industry wants it. And so their standard operating procedures, the way they treat the literally billions of animals in modern meat production that are involved, if you did it to a dog or cat, if you treated a dog or cat that way, you would be subject to felony prosecution. And I'm not talking about the fact that the animal is killed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the lives that the animals lead in factory farms. It's severe, it's really extreme. I'm gonna give just one example, so you know what I'm talking about. And that's, that's what happens to uh, the baby calves, the male calves born to dairy cows. If you think about it, uh, they have to keep dairy cows pregnant all the time because they need them lactating to get the milk. So, uh, otherwise their udders would dry up. So they, they're re-impregnated re re every year. And then half the calves that are born are female, half are male roughly. And the females uh, are shunted off to become four-legged milk pumps like their mothers. But what happens to the males? Can't get male, milk from a male. Those baby, baby infant calves, newborn calves, are taken from their mothers at birth, and they're put in veal barns where they're chained at the neck, and they have a space in each stall so small they can't take a single step in any direction. And they ch they're chained there for four months. They can't take a single step in any direction, and they can't lay down in their normal sleep, sleeping position because the chain is so short. So they have to, to sleep, they have to kind of hunch. Um, they're kept in the dark for the most part, often for four months in the dark. Most of them go blind. They are fed a diet that is deliberate, deliberately and systematically void of iron. So they become increasingly uh, anemic, eventually pathologically anemic. Now, why would they want them blind and anemic? Well, if the animal's anemic, its flesh, which at birth is kind of a grayish color, doesn't become pinkish or reddish. That's the iron that would do that. And we've been taught that, um, the culture at large has been taught, that white meats are healthier. So they call it milk-fed veal. Now, it's not the mother's milk. It's actually government surplus skim milk powder that's part of what they're fed. Uh, and it keeps them, and there, there's no iron in milk at all, so, and, or, nor in anything else they give them. They don't use nails. They use plastic nails in the stalls so the animals can't lick uh, and get any iron from the nails. The, the whole thing is designed to make them anemic so that the flesh will be this white color. Now they chain them at the neck so tightly because they don't want them to move. The reason they don't want them to move is because if the animal moves, it will develop some muscle tone, some musculature, and they want the muscle tissue to be as flaky and tender, i.e. as undeveloped as a muscle as possible. They call this tender veal. So this high-end product that's made into veal cacciatore and these dishes that you'll find in fancy restaurants, particularly Italian restaurants, is actually the flesh of a tortured baby animal, a newborn animal that is kept under conditions that I think violate just about anybody's sensitivities. I really want to emphasize again, this isn't an issue I don't think for animal rights activists and vegetarians. In fact, the vegetarians are the people who don't eat this. If I were eating meat, I'd, I'd really be alarmed about this. I, I, I don't want to eat the products of torture. And I actually believe, to tell you the truth, that there is some correlation. I can't prove this, I don't know how to document this, but I do feel intuitively there's some correlation between when animals are treated with this degree of, of, of cruelty, their lives are this much misery and fear. 
what happens to the people's emotional states who eat this day in, day out? What happens to us as human beings if the meat we're eating, the dairy products we're eating, are coming from conditions, animals kept in these kinds of conditions? That kind of question, I think, needs to be raised. I think it's an authentic question. I don't know how to answer it totally. But I think it's a question we need as a society to, to look at. Um, if your prayer is, at some level, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, you know that, that uh, old prayer? If you, if you hearken to that, if that, that speaks to you, does it make sense, does it help the manifestation, the actualization of that impulse to be eating food that comes from conditions like that? I don't think so. I really don't. And if you see how severe it is, and what I've described as the conditions in veal calf raising is equivalent. The details are a little different. But the degree of control and the degree of restriction of movement and the degree of, of unnatural uh, feed, giving them feedstuffs that are unnatural to their physiology, that's rampant. That's across the board in, in feedlot beef, in dairy cows, in chicken, uh, in, in hens uh, producing our eggs. Uh, in turkeys, it's in, 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 in hog production. This is, the industry has become all about the dollar. All about the dollar. Not about the dollar and other things, like the health of the people eating the product. It's only the dollar. So the health of the people eating the product is not part of the equation. It's not part of the thinking. And nor is the well-being of the animals involved. These, these people don't wake up in the middle of the night thinking, how do I be cruel to animals? How do I produce a product that's as unhealthy as possible? They don't do that. They do wake up in the middle of the night asking themselves, how do I cut costs? And it just so happens that the things they end up doing that cut costs almost invariably end up being harder and harder on the animals and producing food that is less and less healthy for us to eat. So I think we need to be aware of this uh, in order to protect ourselves, in order to re uh, Reclaim our food system from Monsanto, from McDonald's, from industrial agriculture, from the agrochemical orientation, um, from the GMO mentality. Um, it, you see it in factory farms, this, this degree of chasing the dollar at all costs. Nothing else matters. The well-being of the environment doesn't matter if you pollute you just, it just, you, you find a way to externalize the cost. You know, you find somebody, someone else t picks up the tab. Eventually the taxpayer. Eventually the larger earth community does. And, and then you just move on. And, and that's how it's done. And we're all paying a really terrible price for it. Um, right now, as a, as a country, we have the highest rate of obesity that any country has ever had in the history of the planet. We have the highest rate of childhood diabetes of any country that has ever existed on the history of the Earth. We spend more money on what we call health care than any other country. In fact, we spend more money on what we call health care than the next 10 countries combined. And we are the only industrialized country that doesn't provide basic health care to all of our citizens. We don't really have a healthcare industry. We have a disease management industry. The money is not in helping people to keep their blood pressure low, which is pretty simple to do with a healthy diet, actually. But the money is in the pills. And so we let people eat food that raises their blood pressure. We actually encourage that, we subsidize those foods, make them cheaper, people buy them, their blood pressure goes up, then the drugs co companies profit from the sale. This is a disease-based economy. Um, we spend $300 billion a year in this country, every, annually, every year, on drugs, pharmaceutical drugs. That is half of the amount that's spent in the entire world. We're 4% of the world's population. We spend by 50% of the drugs. And 70% of the antidepressants, which we can just talk what that means. Um, why do we have a Food and Drug Administration? Did you ever think about that? Do you think food isn't important enough to have its own agency, our food? It's because if you eat the food, you're going to need the drugs. This is the system we've created. 
And it, in, under, under these circumstances, it's a revolutionary act, I think, to be aware and to take action, to swim again, upstream against the current of society, which will wash you down to the fast food joint and to Burger King and McDonald's, and that's your choice. That's, that's your freedom. That's consumer freedom. I don't think so. I don't think freedom is which of the 31 flavors do I want? I believe me, I grew up with that stuff. I think the freedom that we want is to live, how do we choose and have available choices that we can live healthy lives and create healthy communities, have healthy families, have, look forward to a healthy future in a healthy, on a healthy planet. I mean, I think that seems like a radical thought. That seems like pie in the sky, almost idealistic thinking under the conditions of today. That's why I call it revolutionary. It does go against the grain of our ain't it awful society uh, and our victim thinking. But we can take these actions. I just finished a couple days ago uh, a food revolution summit with which I co-ran co with my son, Ocean. And uh, we had 73,000 participants for the week, for eight days. There are a lot of people waking up, a lot of people wanting to be part of this food revolution, wanting to make their lives a statement of compassion in how they eat and in health, so that what, what you're eating is, is, is actually contributing to, to, to your well-being, and actually contributing to the kind of life and experience in your body that you want to have, the vibrancy, the vitality, the beauty, uh, the mental clarity, um, the emotional serenity, and, and, and the spiritual alignment that makes life fulfilling and wonderful. So that's the basics of um, my message. There's lots I could say, but why don't we open to, to some questions or comments? Is what, what's being evoked in you hearing me? Do you have any thoughts you want to share or questions? And I think the open question, at least in omnivore's dilemma, as far as I know, is whether sustainable farming is scalable, right? Um, we know that big food is, is mistreating animals and polluting the environment um, in order to maximize their profit. But at the same time, they do produce a lot of food. And so, you know, has anyone figured out whether these sustainable farming methods yes. can feed yes. our entire country? Yes. Well, the reason the big food is profitable um, and does produce extravagant amounts of food-like substances is that they are subsidized heavily. For example, um, feedlots and factory farms don't pay their own pollution costs. The governments pick that up. Um, if they had to pay for the pollution they cause, that would raise the price of their foods considerably. Um, people would buy less inclined to buy them. Um, Another example is the feed that they're, that the, it's basically corn and soy that they feed to the hogs and the cattle and the, and the chickens um, and the dairy cows. It comes from industrial plantations, huge monocultures, most of them GMO, um, saturated with herbicides, just saturated with it. Um, they don't, and, and that's subsidized. So the cost to the, to the meat industry of those feedstuffs is almost nothing, almost nothing. We pay for it as taxpayers. Um, be you vegetarian or a meat eater, you're paying for that through your taxes. And, and also through the pollution then that we live with, the, 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 the decrease in soil fertility, the, the, the loss of water resources, the, the, the drying up of wells throughout the Midwest. The, we're, we're paying for it in so many ways. Um, but those costs are externalized. We don't subsidize organic agriculture. We subsidize uh, agrochemical-based agriculture. So that tilts the playing field and makes organics very expensive. Have you ever wondered why, when you go to Whole Foods or anywhere, the organic food costs more? I mean, some people want it more, will pay that premium and can, but why does it cost more? Because of the subsidies. We subs in the farm bill, it's all there. I think, and, and I'm more to think, I'm working for this, that we should not just tilt the playing field so it's level, although that would be an improvement. I want to tilt it in the other direction. So that organic, I want to put a tax on pesticides, for example, and then use the income from that to lower the price to the consumer of organic food. It's a revenue neutral solution. It's fairly simple. And what happens is then, is uh, conventionally grown food, as we call it, food grown with agrochemicals, becomes more expensive. 
Th same thing, I put tax factory farm, meat production, and put, use the revenue to decrease the cost of humanely raised. It, it, again, turning the, turning the thing topsy-turvy from where it is now. The incentives are perverse the way they are. Um, could we produce enough meat that way uh, as, as much as we produce now? No. We eat way too much. We have heart disease. I mean, ha it, it's still the leading killer in, in the country. And people who eat far less meat, we know, all the data show, there's a mountain of studies that show this, have far less heart disease. They have far less colon cancer. I and mean, it's, it's a healthier diet to get away from that. So we don't need nearly as much. Now McDonald's, though, wants to sell all. See, they, they're really, they've got a tremendous marketing plan. I have to tell you, Ray Kroc was the founder, owner for many years, CEO for many years of McDonald's. Um, Ray Kroc, before he started McDonald's, worked for my father. <laughs> and my father invented franchising. Baskin Robbins was the first franchised food, food place. And Ray Kroc was in charge of the franchising department. And he said to my dad one day, I want to go out and try this with burgers. And that, and that became McDonald's. Um, I've actually never eaten at McDonald's <laughs> because I don't want to. I, I may be the only one in the country that hasn't. When I see those signs, you know, that brag about how many billions have been sold, I always think of how many thousands of square miles of rainforest have been destroyed, how many heart attacks have happened, how many animals have been tortured. Um, I, I think of, of, the, of the families who, like, like my uncle when he died at the age of 54, his family, what happened? You know, the loss, the pain. Um, I think of the families where that's happening. So I don't, I don't like, I'm not, oh wow, another billion sold. I'm like, that, how do we get them out of business? You know, I, I would like to see um, plant strong diets become the norm. Uh, people eating lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. How about we put a, ta a tax on junk food and then use that income to, to subsidize the, the, the uh, lower the price of fresh vegetables and fresh fruits. So people now who are very cost uh, price sensitive, the, the cheapest calories are always junk, always junk. High fructose corn syrup, um, isolated soy ingredients, uh, highly processed foods, McDonald's. You get a lot of calories per your dollar, but you do not get a lot of nutrition. That is why we have poor people financially stressed people who are obese and malnourished. That's a terrible predicament. It's what we've created with our food system. And there are ways we can change the food system and then we could feed everybody good food. Not, not the level of meat consumption, though, that we've grown accustomed to, that we identify with affluence. We've come to think of, of, of meat as the reward of affluence. And eating things like legumes, um, lentils, and split peas, and, and garbanzo beans and as, as peasant food. We, can, we, we have a class uh, stratification there. And, and when you think that way, then, then you feel bad about yourself if you're just eating peasant food. And you're eating potatoes, and you're eating cabbage, and you're eating carrots, and you're eating lentils, and you're eating split pea soup, and you feel like you're at the bottom of the rung. Whereas the, the, the veal parmesan <laughs> is like the high thing. But that's, that's going to kill you. It's killing the it's a terrible thing to the veal, veal calf. It, it, we got we to gotta find our roots back in the earth and not be ashamed of it, that we're creatures of humans, that we're human comes from the same root as the word humus or earth or soil. And we can find our roots and we can feed ourselves a plant-strong diet, um, a healthy one, with less resources, less land than is now going to produce a, uh, a meat-based diet, yes? What actually is going on in terms of the data? Because if you look around, you see, I feel like I see a lot of more people giving up meat, you see juice bars popping up, you see a lot more healthy food. I read an article about hummus taking off, but then you go to the ferry building and there's a store called Salty Tasty Pig Parts, and there's all these cool restaurants popping up that are all about like the most obscure kind of meat you can eat. So, like, you know the data. Like, what really is growing? What's happening? Both. Both. <laughs> it, it, you know, the, 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 the light is getting brighter, and the, dark, the shadows are getting darker. We, we're living in an interesting time of crisis in many ways. 
um, in which both sides are, you know, we're seeing some signs of real progress, more awareness, people taking steps to live healthier lives. Um, we're going to have a GMO labeling bill nationally within the next two years. Um, we may have Washington State, Vermont may, may pass one this year. Um, there's a lot of different things. Organic food production has increased 26-fold in the last 25 years. Um, feedlot beef consumption, after Diet for America was published, went down 25% in the next five years. Um, there, there's a lot of good signs, but on the other hand, uh, Monsanto is really trying to control policy, and they're succeeding to quite an extent. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of dark things happening. Um, that's why it's so important to be alive today, to be present, to be engaged, to be aware, to be, because each of us makes a difference with the way we live. And, and, and sometimes you can say, well, these forces are so great. The numbers of, that are involved, dollar figures, are so great. Uh, the, the, these entities, the corporations, industries, that have so much to gain financially from the way things have been, even though it's destroying the health of our, of our nation even, and our people. Uh, they're not going to accede lightly to their, to their profits. So what, what, what can we do? It's very important that we do everything we can. My experience has been that when you do what you can, truly, and stretch yourself in that way, you find yourself capable of doing more. Somehow you become more capable of bearing the responsibility. You meet people, things happen, you go stronger. A, a, a kind of simplistic analogy is to weight training. If you work out with a weight and you, you, you confront a weight that's heavy for you and you do so systematically, you find it becomes lighter for you and you become capable of lifting more weight. That's how the muscle responds to the stress. That's a simplistic analogy, but when we as, as existential beings, as spiritual beings, as people on a journey here together, uh, do everything we can and stretch and, and work on that edge of, of ourselves, on that growing edge of how accountable can we be for our lives. Uh, how engaged can we be with others in, in, in a respectful way, in a passionate way? Uh, how connected can we be to the earth so that we, 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 we speak on its behalf, we act on its behalf, we live on its behalf? And, and how, how engaged can we be with, with the whole earth community so we find ourselves living with some reverence for life, even in a society that is as materialistic as ours? Um, what happens is you become a greater person. You become more human and more powerful and more connected to your soul. And that's where your power comes from. And the more of us that do this, uh, the more we become a force uh, that is certainly going to be heard from. Will we m be loud enough? Will we be able to, to turn the tide in time? We will find out. But we're going to find out kicking and screaming. You know, we're going to find out doing everything we can as opposed to just hiding in the ain't it awful attitude and being passive and resigned and suspicious and cynical. It's very cool. You know, people are like, oh, yeah, it's really, yeah, 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 yeah. That's going to get us nowhere. So, yeah. Um, I actually had the pleasure to host Ingrid Newkirk here uh -huh. at Google. So I learned a lot about um, the dairies and how, like you just mentioned, about the cows. Um, how they're impregnated, and then the calves are taken away. So I contacted Strauss to learn, because I, I don't eat meat, but I do like my milk and cheese, because yeah. I wanted to find yes. you know, what is available out there as a consumer. And one thing they shared with me, and I'm glad they actually shared this, was that the cows, yes, they're in the field, they're, they're fed you know, pure um, natural products, but when it comes to the actual slaughtering, um, not only is their lifespan extended because they are given good food, um, so which means like two to three to four years more of horror of being you know, constantly impregnated, but then what they also shared is that um, the slaughtering, it's the same process, whether it's organic or non-organic. Yeah, it's, it's true. The, the USDA requires this. By the way, Strauss dairy, if you're going to eat dairy products in the Bay Area, Strauss is one of the best. So. Um, I don't, personally. I feel healthier without it. Uh, I believe the data show most people would be healthier without any dairy products. But if you're going to, you want to get them as humanely as possible, um, Strauss is not a bad choice. Um, 
but it's a low bar because <laughs> the factory dairies are, are, are deplorable. Um, and in every, as you're, she was saying, the USDA has requirements about slaughtering of animals destined for, for hamburger or any other form of meat consumption. So they have to be slaughtered in USDA certified slaughterhouses, which are these horror chambers. So someone like Strauss or um, uh, Nyman Ranch, there's, there's these niche groups really trying to do something in a, in a, in a more envir environmentally positive way and a more humane way and a more healthy way. And, and, and oftentimes they, they do to some extent. They, they, there, there are improvements there. But then when it comes to slaughter, and every dairy cow, by the way, every dairy cow ends up as hamburger. So it, it's not that, <laughs> that there isn't killing involved there. And every one of their male calves ends up as veal. Uh, so they're killed at, at the age of three or four months. So the dairy cows, instead of in the factory, typical factory dairies, they live to four or five. It, it's Strauss, they may go to seven, but they end up being slaughtered in a conventional slaughterhouse, uh, trucked there under conditions that are exactly the industry norm. Um, Nicolette Diamond, who, who is the, um, whose husband, Leroy Nyman, founded Nyman Ranch, the largest um, humanely raised uh, operation in the country. Uh, I've talked to her at length about this. She just hates it. She used to go, because she, she would know the animals. She'd have names for them. And then she would actually go in the truck with, because the poor animals were under such stress. And she saw the misery, and she just, she got out of it because she couldn't bear that part of it. Um, we don't let them do their own slaughtering. We don't let them find a humane way to do it. And, and I gotta tell you, if I were to describe to you in detail what goes on in, in factory slaughterhouses, in, you would cringe. You, you just would not wanna hear it. It would ruin your lunch, I promise you. I, I'm not gonna do it. I don't wanna infl inflict that. But at the same time, if we eat the products of this system, that's how we really inflict it on the animals because we're paying them, the producers, to do this. When, every time we buy a product, we're basically selling, saying to the seller, do it again. You know, and they will. They'll read your purchase that way. And um, I don't want to support these people. I don't want to support them with what they're doing. Um, that's another reason why I am <laughs> abstinent from, from their products. Um, and also because I feel so much better. I'm 65. I'm a marathon runner. I'm a triathlete. I feel great. I, my blood pressure is 90 over 60, and that's not with drugs. Um, and I see at my age, 65, I see guys aging very differently, depending on how they've lived and the choices they've made. And, and there's no guarantees. Some vegans die at 30. With some, you know, there's no guarantees, but, there's, but there are probabilities that are very strong. And you want a higher quality of life and a longer health span, eat a plant-strong diet. Don't eat processed foods. Don't eat a lot of sugar. Don't eat a lot of ice cream. I have to say it. It's mm -hmm. true. And if you live in, in, and you make a choice for your own integrity and your own well-being, instead of the consumer obsessions of our society, uh, you'll be a healthier person, a happier person. You'll have more beauty inside yourself. Your, lives will be, your life will be richer. Your relationships will flourish more. And you'll be glad that you're alive. And I think that's quite a lot. Thank you. Hi, uh, one, one, more one more question, question. don't right. clap yet. So can you talk a little bit more about the food revolution? It sounds really interesting. Is that for folks in the industry or is it consumers who can go? Like how would people get involved with that or help to learn more and really be a part of that? You can go to, the, the best way to do it, it's a fantastic website. If you go to foodrevolution.org, foodrevolution, one word, dot O-R-G, there's a term, that you will find a great amount of resources there. And the Food Revolution Network, of which I'm co-founder, just put on, and we do this annually, an eight-day summit. And th that just ended, but we'll do another one soon. But there are a lot of things happening in the meantime. It's a network uh, to support people at whatever level of political activism they want to be at. Um, some people, their activism is just to buy more consciously. Um, uh, that's a good step. That's real, that's valid, that matters. Uh, other people, start getting involved you know, with writing, signing petitions, um, um, informing other people. There's, there's, there's those opportunities too. 
Uh, we started the Food Revolution Network 14 months ago. We now have 150,000 members. Uh, it's growing rapidly. And what we have found is that we can send out, if something is happening um, in Washington, and it's right that, that, that day, we can send out an email that day telling people what they need to do and giving, giving them the wherewithal to do it. And we can get 150,000 uh, uh, people signing a petition w within, within 24 hours. And we can deliver that to this, and we can do it state by state. So if we're trying to influence a particular legislator um, uh, or, on, or on a particular le legislation, we can do that. We can tailor it. And it's, it matters. And, and, and it's, so it's a way that you can uh, become involved with this issues, these issues. Um, and you might have, be more concerned about GMOs, or you might be more concerned about pesticides, or you might be more concerned about the treatment of animals uh, in factory farms, or you might be more concerned about something I hadn't mentioned, but it's very big, is the targeting of kids with junk food ads. The soda pop industry spends a billion dollars a year on ads that target children with soda pop ads. There is a, uh, a small effort that the CDC just this month started to do. They have a budget of a million dollars for it. That's not much to try to encourage uh, kids, high school kids in particular, to, to have a soda-free summer. There is a congressman from uh, Illinois. His name is Aaron Schock, young guy. He has just proposed a bill that would make it illegal for the CDC or any of the other agencies that the CDC supports, or the National Institute of Health, Institutes of Health, or any organization that they support, to educate or um, communicate any message uh, that would try to uh, reduce the consumption of any legally marketed food, i.e., he's trying to make it illegal for the CDC to spend a million dollars telling kids soda pop isn't great for your health, whereas, whereas Pepsi and Coke spend a billion dollars telling kids to drink this stuff. This is a weird world sometimes. You know, He says that the messages of the CDC are propaganda. The reason that this guy, Aaron Schock, is doing this, his district is the home of Hostess Company. They went bankrupt a little while. They make the Twinkies and the, I mean, you talk about junk food. They are kind of our junk food central. And, and uh, they're in trouble and they're, they're, they're going through a buyout. They're going to be back in business soon. And he doesn't want the government to uh, put out messages that would decrease the consumption of Twinkies. Well. I, I ask, why are Twinkies cheaper per calorie than carrots? Because of our subsidies. We gotta, we gotta take this twisted situation, this perverse situation, and twist it back so that we're in alignment with our good, the goodness in our hearts and in, in each other. I think we can do that, and that's why I'm involved in this, and, and I invite all of you to join me. Great, thanks so much. Thank you.